I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I have to start the school again. Well, doesn't that make you happy? Oh, yes, yes, of course. It will be nice seeing all my schoolmates again because some of them were away to camp, you know, and others were on trips, you know, and others went to other places, you know. So I didn't see them all the time during vacation, see? Yes, I see. And then there'll be your teacher, too, you know. Oh, yes, I'm going to have a new one, and I understand she's very nice, and I'm anxious to meet her. And I know you're anxious to learn a lot and know things about the world and about life. Yes, especially about life and people and what they do in different places. School is very interesting, especially the first part of the year when you just come back. Well, I'm glad to know that you're anxious to go to school again. And I hope you have a very successful year. Thank you. Now, could you please read the funnies? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> Out at the army camp where Beetle is stationed, Beetle is walking alone. He crosses the road. A major is approaching in a jeep. He sees Beetle. Hey, look out! Too late. Beetle is hit. And lands on the ground. Oh, oh, please, somebody. Help. Help a poor dying man. And the Major exclaims, please, Ouch, I hit my nose on the windshield. I'm potentially lying dead. The Major was hurt. The Major was hurt. Quick, 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 quick. The Major was hurt. And in a second, two lieutenants gather around the Major. Hey, I've got a nosebleed. A hemorrhage of the proboscis. Call an ambulance. 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 Beetle, lying on the ground, looks up to the lieutenant and moans, Hey, I've got a pain in my... Take it easy, Major. Take it easy. The ambulance will be right here. Last picture top row, the lieutenant says to the other lieutenant, You better give him first aid treatment for shock. Beetle lifts his leg and says to the lieutenant, Hey, my leg is... Hey, quick man, quick man, the stretcher. The Major's hurt. Hey, quick man, the stretcher. The Major's hurt. Major, he's hurt? Yes, sir. One stretcher coming up. First picture, bottom row, the Major is loaded on the stretcher. Now, man, no need for all this fuss. I'm probably all right. Now, you let the head surgeon decide that after he gives you some tests and x-rays. And still lying on the ground, Beetle says faintly, My arm, my arm. Okay, Major, in you go. And the Major is slid into the ambulance. Here, have a cigar, sir. It'll calm your jangled nerves. Thanks, Lieutenant, thanks. And suddenly the Major exclaims, Say, we've been thinking about my injuries so much we almost overlooked something. Beetle, thinking the Major has finally remembered him, sits up with a smile. Call the motor pool and have him give my Jeep a check over. Yes, sir, Major. Right away, Major. And Beetle, thoroughly disgusted, gets to his feet. Phooey, I'll go and put on my own bandages. He starts to walk off. Hold it, soldier. And last picture, the lieutenant grabs Beetle by the collar and drags him back. You can be court-martialed for leaving the scene of an accident, but, but, you know. But, but... Oh, that poor Beetle. Yeah. Everybody fusses over the Major just because he bumped his nose against the windshield. But nobody pays any attention at all to Beetle, and he was hit by the Jeep. Instead, they grab him by the collar and drag him back when he wants to leave. <laughs> yes, and, and he can't even bandage himself up. Nope, it looks like Beetle is in trouble. <laughs> Trouble is that he's in the army. I'm afraid so. Well, now let's turn over the page and go past little iodine and Prince Val. Turn over to page four and look on page five. There's Walt Disney's The Sword and the Rose, a romantic story which takes place in the early days of England when Henry was the king. And I've been worried 
worried about this because the king's sister, Mary, is in love with Charles Brandon, who is handsome and brave and daring. And the two of them ran away to get married, but the king captured them and has thrown Charles Brandon in jail. And he said he was going to have Charles Brandon put to death if the princess didn't marry that old king of France. And so, in order to save Charles Brandon's life, the princess has said that she would marry the king of France. Well, let's read now and find out if he does. Here we go with the sword and the rose. It's merry, merry England, when knighthood was in flower. Music to bewitch our story hour. The day has come when the English princess is to marry the king of France. She has gone to France where the wedding is to take place. at Abbeville Cathedral, amid the clangor of bells and the booming of cannon, Mary Tudor becomes the wife of the aged Louis XII, who saved the life of the man she loved. Third picture top row, that evening in the banquet room of the castle, the old king rises to his feet looks at the lovely young princess, holds aloft a goblet of wine, and offers a toast. Noble knights, come pledge with me your love and devotion to the Queen of France. Meanwhile, across the sea in a cold cell in London Tower, Charles Brandon languishes without a word of what has happened. The Duke of Buckingham had promised Mary he would tell Charles that she has married the King of France to save Brandon's life. But he has not kept his promise. Nor has he set Brandon free after the marriage, as he had promised to do. First picture, bottom row, Brandon hears the door to his dungeon open. Hey, Buckingham, what prompts this extraordinary honor? Yes, it is the Duke at last. He comes into the cell and says... A promise I made to Her Majesty, the Queen of France. She that was Mary Tudor. Brandon looks at the Duke with disbelief in his eyes that his beloved Mary has married someone else. You find it hard to believe that Mary is now the bride of King Louis XII? I... I do. Before she accepted the crown of France and the jewels and the silken gowns, she asked that you be allowed to pursue your interrupted journey to the new world. With bitterness in his heart that his Mary had not remained faithful to him, Brandon exclaims, most thoughtful of her. Last picture, he looks up. Then, then you'll release me? A look of cunning comes into the Duke's eyes. Well, uh, not openly, Brandon. I dare not risk the King's displeasure. But, uh, an escape might be arranged. And the stricken Brandon, mercilessly deluded about Mary's marriage, falls into Buckingham's trap. Oh, that's not right. King Henry said that Charles Brandon could go free after the princess married the king of France. That's right, he did. Well, then why is the duke saying it must look like Charles is escaping? I think this is a trap to get Charles Brandon into more trouble. Well, maybe we'll find out more about this next week. But now, look at the bottom of the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And then Roy was helping a little boy named Chili, who was being chased by two bad men named Cash Baxter and, and Gaffer. Yes, the boy had found a saddle, and the men were trying to get the saddle away from him. And Gaffer had stolen it from Chili's horse and had galloped away with it. And Roy and Chili had followed him. And just as Roy was just about to catch him, Gaffer rode right up to the edge of the cliff and jumped off his horse over the cliff, taking the saddle with him. I wonder if he was killed. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Hi yip by yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip by yo Roy looks over the cliff where Gaffer had disappeared. Hey, Chelly, we got to get down into Stone Canyon and try to find that saddle. That fall probably killed Gaffer. Hey, better we take Senor Gaffer's horse along, Roy. He get thirsty here. 
Meanwhile, below on the canyon floor, Gaffer is very much alive. He has landed in a net which had been stretched over some poles and covered with green brush. The net had broken his fall. Last picture top row, he stands up, picks up the saddle. Uh, I'll wait in the shack for Cash Baxter. I got pay coming for killing Pate Preston and fetching his saddle here. First picture, bottom row. Gaffer's horse leads Roy and Chili to the blind end of Stone Canyon. Roy sees the net of chicken wire that had broken Gaffer's fall. Well, so this is the ground Gaffer made the hole in, eh? Camouflage chicken wire. They are very strange things, Senor Roy. Inside the cabin, where Gaffer and Cash are talking, Gaffer looks through the window. Hey, Cash, look. Rogers and the kid, they got my horse. Gaffer, you should have known your horse would seek its own corral. We got to work fast. Come on. And a second later, the door to the cabin opens and Chili and Roy enter. They see the room is empty. Chili points to the table and exclaims, Senor Roy, the saddle. Now maybe we can find out what's hidden in it. It may explain the murder of Marge Preston's uncle. Last picture, Roy examines the saddle. He finds a little compartment in it. And in the compartment, two shiny plates. He takes the plates out and exa- He takes the plates out and exclaims, counterfeiting plates. Suddenly, Chili exclaims, Senor Roy, the wall, it is moving. That's right. Well, that's against the law. Yes, it is. Well, those two men are really crooks. And they've been hidden behind that false wall, and they know that Roy has discovered their secret. Oh, and the wall is moving. I wonder if that means danger for well, we'll Roy. We'll find that out next week. But now let's go to the very last page of the first section and see what's happening to Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, I'm anxious to know because Flash and Midas and Dale are on their way back from a planet called Titan with that giant they captured. Yes, you bet. But remember, as they were nearing Earth, suddenly things looked different? Yeah, I wonder what's gone wrong because Flash said that the Earth has changed. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Last picture, top row, Midas looks at the giant who is locked in his cage and says, We're going to be rich, boys. That giant is money in the bank. Flash snaps. All right, Midas, cut out the chatter and man your station. You may never get down to the ground but spend your fortune. Stand by for landing. First picture, bottom row... They have landed safely. The cargo ramp has been let down, and the chain giant is led out under guard. Flash says, well, he knows what our guns can do, but be careful, Midas. And then Flash looks around, and he stops in amazement. No, it can't be. Look, Midas, at the landing field, at the people. At last picture, as men come running up to the rocket ship, Midas and the others see that they tower above them like giants. Flash exclaims, Something's the matter with my eyes. A giant looks like the size of a normal Earthman. And we look like midgets. Yes, that's true. Everybody on Earth looks like the same size as the giant. But Flash and the others, they look very tiny. Yes, they look like little midgets, as Flash says. I wonder what the reason is. Well, maybe we'll find the answer to this great mystery next week. But now it's time to pick up the second section of the Comic Weekly. Oh, yeah. Today. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Rama food, Rama pum, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood has settled down to read the paper. Blondie comes in and makes a shattering announcement. Come, dear. We're going downtown and buy you a new suit. But I don't need a new suit. Yes, you do. We'll get you a nice new blue one. 
If I have this one cleaned and pressed and you sew the pockets, it'll be just like new. A man in your position must look well groomed. Come. First picture, second row. They go down Main Street. Blondie sees a woman's shop and turns in. Why are they going into a woman's shop? First, I want to get a few things for myself. And 15 minutes later, Dagwood is sitting sadly in a chair, watching Blondie pick out a new dress. I think a wife should look nice, too. It gives her husband added prestige. A half hour later, last picture, second row, Dagwood is sitting slumped in a chair in a woman's hat shop while Blondie is trying on hats. Dagwood, don't you think it'll be cute if I buy things to match your new suit? You know, a husband and wife ensemble. Uh Uh-huh. An hour later, they're in a woman's shoe store, and Blondie has tried on one pair of shoes after another. No, I don't think I care for those either. Bagwood jumps to his feet and heads for the door. I'll go out and buy my own suit while you finish your shopping. Okay, dear, I'll meet you later. Three minutes later, Dagwood is in a man's clothing store, wearing his old blue suit. He says to the salesman... I want a dark blue suit. Fine, I've got a nice brown one on sale today for 50% off. I'll try it. Five minutes later, last picture, third row, Dagwood, wearing a large, double-breasted brown suit, stares at himself in the mirror. I like it. It fits you perfectly. It doesn't need any alterations. I'll take it. First picture, bottom row, Blondie comes tripping down the street. Dagwood comes out of the store dressed in his new 50% off brown suit. Blondie sees him. Oh! How do you like it? Brown, I thought you were going to buy blue. Brown was 50% off. Now I'll have to buy another whole new outfit to match a brown suit. Dagwood's hat pops off. Oh, no! Dagwood jerks off his coat, the pants, and dashes into the clothing store last picture. Uh, yes, sir, what can I do for you? Oh, it's you. Can I exchange this for a suit that doesn't match anything? Oh, that was really, really funny. <laughs> Didn't Dagwood look silly in that new brown suit? Well, he looked a whole lot sillier running into the store without the new brown suit. <laughs> yes, and he's underwear, all because Blondie said that she'd have to buy a brown outfit to go with his brown suit. <laughs> Yes, he certainly is funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, how would you like to see what Br'er Rabbit is doing? Oh, I'd love to see what Br'er Rabbit is doing. He's so sweet. All right, let's turn over the page and go past page two, turn over page three, and here on page four of the second section is Uncle Remus. Oh, dear old Uncle Remus. And here we go with dear old Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Sometimes Br'er Bar gets too high in the world for his own good. Yep, there have been some bad doings in Br'er Rabbit's community. Someone has been stealing all the honey. A delegation of the creators, led by Br'er Rabbit, has come to Br'er Bar's cave. And there they find Br'er Bar lying back, taking it easy, surrounded by jugs and pans full of honey. Br'er Rabbit shakes his finger in Br'er Bar's face. Br'er Bar, I expect you is the one what's been raiding the community honey tree. Br'er Bar dips his finger in the honey and takes a sip. Uh, how do you do? No, it's me. You has got to catch me at it uh, first. If you dodge it again, us is going to catch you. <laughs> and sooner than you think, Br'er Rabbit has worked out a scheme. Third picture top row, he and the creators are pulling a tree stump, which is on a little wagon, out into the woods. And last picture top row, they cover the wheels of the wagon with brush, so the wagon cannot be seen. Then Br'er Rabbit climbs to the top of this stump and empties a gallon of honey over the top. And Br'er Rabbit looks down the road. Hey, hurry up down there. I think I see Br'er Bar coming. But well, Archie's ready. Br'er Rabbit slides down the tree. And they all scamper into the woods and hide. 
And then, from their hiding places, they see Brother Barr approach. First picture about a row, he comes up to the honey-covered tree and stops. The great day. Look at that. A brand new dripping honey tree. He shinnies up the tree. Takes a good lick of the honey. The man. I is right on top of the world. Then out of the bushes, tiptoe Brer Rabbit and his pals. They give the tree a shove. And it starts to roll down the hill with Brer Bar hanging under the top of the tree stump. Hey, hey, hey. Brer Bar looks around. The, this here tree has got the wheels. Straight down the hill it goes, down the main street of the community. And heads straight for the jail. And crashes smack into it. And last picture, Burr Possum shouts, Thank you, Raider Sheriff. Yeah, caught in the tree. And Burr Barr, his back aching from the bump into the jail, looks down from his tree stump and groans, I has been railroaded. And Uncle Remus says, When the spirit of fever moves, you better get out of the way. Mm, that, that was a neat trick. Yeah, <laughs> a very neat one. Brer Rabbit set quite a trap, didn't he? And Brer Bar walked right into it. You mean he climbed right up it? <laughs> That's funny. He did climb right into a trap and landed in jail. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. Well, now let's go to the very last page of the Comic Weekly. Oh, look. Here's Dick's adventure. And remember, this is in the early days of America in the state of California. And you remember that gold had been discovered and everybody left their jobs and homes to go find gold so they could get rich. And you remember that Dick and his friend, Mr. Kimball, had gone along to see what they could find. And they were led by a man that I don't trust. His name was Pick Pan. I wonder what'll happen. Will they find gold? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. That's some music for adventurous Dick. Dick and Editor Kimball and the crafty rogue pick man reach the American River where thousands are already panning for the precious metal. Dick's eyes catch the glitter of something on the ground. He leaps off his horse. He stop a minute, stop! Last picture, top row, he picks up a shiny rock. Here, look, look, a gold nugget. And in the next second, first picture, second row, a chorus of voices starts mocking. Quack, quack. That's fool's gold, you goose. Dick suddenly feels foolish. Editor Kimball says, Yeah, bite it, Dick. All's not gold that glitters. If it sticks together, it's real gold. If it falls apart, it's fool's gold. Pyrite, sulfurate of iron, which looks like gold. Last picture, second row, Dick digs his teeth into the nugget. To his vast disappointment, it splits apart. Sadly, he mounts up. And first picture, bottom row, to the gradually diminishing cries of quack, quack, the party continues on. Pick Pan says, Too many gold panners there anyway. Let's hit out farther. Last picture, up a turbulent branch of the American River they plod, past ridges topped by towering pines. And even here, there are crowds of prospectors, with more coming in from every side. And Dick wonders, where will we ever find a place where we can be to ourselves to dig for some real gold? Yes, but did you ever know that there was something like fool's gold? No, I really didn't. I was very interested to learn about it. So if I ever find any gold lying around, I can test it by biting into it. Yes, that's very good to know. You think Dick will really find gold, real gold? Well, maybe we'll find out more about that next week. Now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and Rusty is back home again on the Milestone Farm, and I'm so glad. And remember that when he came home, he found that some actors had made a theater out of an old mill near a stream on their place. And one of the men had asked about renting a horse. 
And so Rusty and Patty had brought the man to talk to Tex, who I am sure will loan him a horse. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Tex arranges to loan a horse from the Milestone Farm to Mr. Fidgley, the director of the theatrical company. And Tex has sent Rusty along to take care of the horse. Now the actors are all gathered around on stage, ready for a rehearsal. Second picture, bottom row, the stagehand interrupts. Oh, excuse me, Shorty, but there's a guy outside the stage door who wants to see you. He says it's important. Oh, well, go right ahead, Shorty. We'll take a break. Shorty walks outside. A hard-looking man who is smoking a cigar greets him. Well, Shorty, you gave us a lot of trouble finding you. The boss don't like Welchers, so it'd be a good idea if you handed over that two grand you owed him. Well, now, look, he's got to give me a little time. This is the first job I've had since last winter. Have a heart, will you? The boss ain't a patient man, but I'll give you just one week to get that dough on the line, or else. <laughs> Last picture, Shorty goes back into the playhouse to the rehearsal, wondering how he will ever get $2,000. As he comes on stage, he hears the actress, Doris Fair, speaking to Tweedy Castle, the new girl from Lexington. What a divine necklace, my dear. Why, just lovely. Oh, good gracious, Tweedy. They're real pearls. <laughs> Or get somebody else in trouble. Oh, could it be Rusty? Because Rusty's there taking care of the horses someplace. Yes, I wonder. Well, we'll find out more about this next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. I Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.